to sleep last night. I heard Rennie come in. He told somebody, you missed a good Sunday morning not to come to Sunday school because we didn't have a seven. And I, Rennie's still waiting back there too, so that's a good sign. Well, I hope you've had a good week. It's been a beautiful week weather-wise. I hope it's been a real good week for you also. But if not, go to God's song book, the book of Psalms, and start reading. Because if it wasn't good for you, whatever was bad for you, God's song book has an answer for you. We're not going to sing from God's song book this morning. We're going to sing from our song book. We're going to sing some hymns that we all know right now. So will you stand together? Begin with Jesus saves.
psalm the judge just referred to is the word of God from Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Verse 7, the Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Would you join your hearts with me as we enter his presence through his word? Father, we will lift up our eyes to the mountains because our help comes from you. You are the creator of the mountains. You are the creator of everything. And we look to you. We praise you for not allowing our foot to slip. You are our keeper. You do protect us from the evil one. You keep our souls. You guard our comings and goings. We just want to stop ourselves from you this morning. We want to cast aside all our cares and anxieties because you care for us. And we just offer everything within us. Continue to be glorified and magnified and lifted up at this time. We we'll worship and continue. We praise you, we glorify you, we give you all we have. In Jesus Christ's name. Sorry about trying to rewrite that first verse of this. Some of my it was right up there. It was wrong here. I don't know how I got it right up there because I typed from here. But boy, did I ever get the first verse wrong over there. Uh, anyway, so I'll try to get the next section right. In Christ alone, our hope is life. And he's our God. Let's stand the same.
morning is what we've been trying to do for several weeks and have just not gotten around to it yet. But we're going to do it this morning. If you like a meditation that's soft and quiet, this is for you. If you like a meditation that's kind of in between, this is for you. And if you like a meditation that's loud, then this is for you. Holy, holy, holy.
does, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. We're going to move to Isaiah 53 just a little bit. We're going to start with Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. The issue of suffering. Suffering. Many people struggle with the idea that the concept of, of suffering. Why is there suffering? Many object to Christianity. One of the biggest objections to Christianity is that of suffering. Why would a good God allow suffering? Why would God allow good people to suffer? Why would God allow children to suffer? <coughs> we as Americans, as a general, we don't like to deal with suffering. There's someone suffering there to be avoided or to be solved. It's not an easy issue. It's not an easy answer. But in all the conversations about suffering and about God and suffering, what is often avoided, what is never brought into the conversation is this fact. God himself suffered. God himself suffered. He suffered in the flesh of Jesus Christ. And in his suffering, there were several individuals that encountered him. You know, last week we started this a series that's going to take us through Easter, probably take us through after. Through the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, this account in chapters 23 and 24 of Jesus' journey, his passion towards the cross, towards the tomb, towards resurrection. Well, we entitled this encounter with Jesus, and Jesus, following the Father's perfect will, had a specific role in each stop on the way, if you will, to the cross, to the tomb, to the resurrection. And along the way, there were many individuals that encountered him. Some of these individuals had life-changing transformations. Some were changed a little bit, some had no change at all. And last week we began in Luke 23, if you recall, Pontius Pilate encountered Jesus. King Herod encountered Jesus. Neither one of those men repented. Neither one of them changed their ways. Yet we were confronted. The pride of Pontius Pilate, the power that all these men held, and the recognition that when it comes down to it, we don't really have the power, power over our salvation. We were confronted God's perfect plan that he had. We were confronted with the place that Jesus had in our hearts and lives. And this morning, we encounter the suffering Christ. And after Jesus is condemned, now he is forced to take his cross and start walking towards the crucifixion. And on this journey, he encounters a man named Simon. And in addition, Luke records him encountering a group of unnamed women. They encounter Jesus in his suffering. And as we read Luke 23, verses 26 to 31, we also encounter Jesus in his suffering. Hear the word of God, Luke 31, Luke 23, beginning verse 26 to 31. I'm in the New American Standard, as always. If you want to look along in your own translation or just listen, you're looking at the power of God. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of people, and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus turning them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wounds that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. And then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word. We, we look to you, I pray, for your anointing, for your faith power your, your hand be upon me, help me be faithful to your word. I pray that you take charge of my mind, my thoughts, my mouth. Prepare our hearts to receive your word and prepare to apply and do your word. But Lord, we, I just 
throw myself on you. I need you. Jesus speaking with you, mighty Lord. You're in there for prayer this morning. We pray this now, this in Jesus' name. Amen. So after Jesus is condemned, he is forced to now carry his cross. And all four gospel read writers have different details about the crucifixion. But all four gospel writers, they leave out much of the horrific details of Jesus' suffering, of his scorching, of his beating. It's very, pretty graphic, it's pretty brutal, brutal. It was very common for a criminal who was condemned by crucifixion to have to carry their own cross or a beam on it. And they usually have four Roman soldiers would box them in and walk around them. And it was, it's been said by many scholars, they believe that there was a fifth soldier who had a sign that would have written on it the crime, what this criminal was accused of, to deter those from committing that same crime and also to bring shame and guilt upon that criminal. And we find in, in John's account that Jesus he is so weak from his beatings, from his suffering, he can't even carry his own cross. And so the Roman soldiers called person from the crowd. We find a man named Simon of Cyrene. If they could have called anybody from the crowd, probably tapped him on the shoulder with a spear. Cyrene is in north, modern day North Africa, Libya. It was a long journey. This was not a regular trek for him. He probably really waited. This could have been a once in a lifetime trip, maybe two times in his lifetime. This is a big deal. And yet he's called it, carried this cross of the scripture. Now, was the Simon a believer? Maybe there are some that believe that he became one. In Mark's gospel, when he recites Simon's name, he mentions Simon's two sons. Uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 21. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now, normally you wouldn't mention the names of two sons unless they were probably known by the bodies, by the leaders. And of course, Mark wrote his gospel primarily to those Gentiles, to many Roman Christians. Now, when you go to Paul's letter to the Romans, the very end of the letter, Paul is going through just acknowledging so many different individuals in the Roman church. And Paul mentions a man named Rufus. Romans 16, verse 13. Greet Rufus, a choice man of the Lord, also his mother and mine. What's this to say? Rufus, the son of Simon. Maybe, maybe not. Some will leave. Was. And if that's the case, that means that, that Simon had become a believer in Christian. But we don't know for sure. We've got to be careful about speculation. But what we do know is this man encountered Jesus and had to carry his cross. Now, when we also go on to the text, it says there that Jesus encountered some women. And they're weeping, they're lamenting. And Jesus tells them, hey, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves, weep for your children. And he makes a very, very strange statement. He says, Blessed are the barren, the wounds that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. And women who had children were considered blessed, those who didn't were kind of considered cursed in Jewish society. Jesus was looking towards what's going to happen in 40 years when Rome would conquer Jerusalem, and the fall of Jerusalem, and the temple would be destroyed. And, and he goes on to, to quote Hosea. In verse 30, say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, the tree is green now, the Messiah is there. What will happen when it's dry, when the Messiah is no longer there? What's going to happen, he says, when God's people in Jerusalem who have turned their back on God have to face the consequences of coming to them? Jesus Christ. Suffering, the suffering Christ. He encountered, we find this passage, a man named Simon and a group of unnamed women. And in God's word, as we encounter the suffering Christ this morning, we're confronted with three truths I share with you as we 
walk through God's word. What are we confronted with this morning as we encounter the suffering Christ? Well, number one, first, we are confronted with our call. We are confronted with our call. Our call to take up our cross. Now, in verse 26, it says there, they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Simon, coming in from the country. I told you this was a long journey. And Simon traveled a long way. So can you imagine? He's making this pilgrimage. He's a Jew coming in for Passover, and all of a sudden in the crowd, he's called by the Roman soldiers to carry the cross of this criminal. And what a bummer. But this bummer was actually a hidden blessing. Because he was in the presence of Jesus Christ. He encountered Jesus Christ, the suffering Christ. It brought him in contact with Jesus. And we are confronted with our call as followers of Jesus to carry our own cross. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 27, he says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What's it mean for somebody to carry their own cross? Does that mean when you and I trust Jesus? Okay, we need to, we need to start hammering big, long beams together and carry wherever we go. Well, to understand what he was referring to, we need to hear his words when he called his disciples to deny themselves and go to the cross. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 16, beginning verse 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take his cross and follow me. Verse 25. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is saying, look, you need to understand what you signed up for. Anybody wants to come after me, understand what you have signed up for. There was a young man was called up to go to war when our country declared war in, war in Iraq, Saddam Hussein. The young man didn't want to go. Even though he had joined the army several years before, he joined the army for the benefits, for the insurance, for the pay, for the college tuition. He didn't sign up to go to war. But one of the primary functions of the military is to prepare for war. I've got several veterans in here this morning. When you sign up for the, the military, they have like a little opt-out little place where you can initial. Hey, by the way, if you don't want to go to war, just initial here, you can opt out. They did that, did they? And of course, we think how ridiculous. But how many people sign up for the benefits of following Jesus? Man, I want the blessing. I want to get out of the hell card. We don't understand the cost, the call he gives us. He says, if anyone comes after me, what does it mean to deny ourselves to bring the cross and follow him? Very quickly, it means three things. Our call first means to put down. We put down the self. We put down the self. We renounce the right to ourselves. We renounce the right to rule over our lives. That word to deny, deny himself. It means to completely disown. It means to completely separate oneself from someone. It means you and I say, hey, it's no longer about me. When I follow Jesus, it's no longer about me. But not only do we put down so we need to pick up something. We pick up sacrifice. When we pick up that cross, we pick up sacrifice. Following Jesus is a sacrifice. You and I may lose relationships. We may lose dreams, we may lose material things, we may lose our lives. We pick up sacrifice and go out. We put down, we pick up the third, we pursue. It means we pursue the Savior. Jesus says, follow me. That was his recruitment. That was his, his catchphrase for recruitment, right? Follow me. You may recall the army had that, that catchphrase for recruitment a few years ago. Be all you can be, right? Well, Jesus' catchphrase for recruitment was follow me. Wherever I go, follow me. Wherever I take you, you're going in. It was a way of life. It's a pattern of living. You see, we're confronted with our call to carry our own cross. 
When you follow Jesus in the Bible, you see these big crowds. And here he is, even on the cross, going to the cross. He's got a big crowd. And these big crowds of people, especially read John chapter 6, and they loved his gifts. But they didn't love the life he was calling them to. They loved his gifts, but they did not love the life he was calling them to. And as made today, who love Jesus' gifts. Man, I trust Jesus and I'm going to go to hell. Man, he gives me peace. Man, he blesses me. Man, he makes me feel good. But they don't love the life he's called to. We're confronted with our call. Our call to carry our own cross. But number two, when we encounter the suffering Christ this morning, we're also confronted with our pride. We're confronted with our pride. Now we find out there in verse 27, it says that following him was a large crowd of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. They were beating their chest. They were crying, mourning for Jesus. And Luke gives us an interesting detail in verse 28. Now remember, Jesus is he's so worn out from his beating. This again carries cross. And it says, Jesus turns to these women. And the first one out of his mouth, daughters. You belong to me, you're mine. He says, daughters of Jerusalem. These are not pilgrims who come out of town. They're local residents. They live there in Jerusalem. Daughters of mine of this town, Jerusalem. Stop weeping for me. Hey, Jesus appreciated them weeping for him, but he says, hey, more important than weeping for me, weep for yourselves and your children. Behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren, the wounds that never bore, the rest of the nurse. Remember, that was unheard of for a Jew to consider a woman who didn't have a child in the last. Jesus was looking towards what was going to happen in a few years when the fall of Jerusalem would take place. He's saying, We can cry. Now, why would this happen to them? Well, Jesus wept and cried over Jerusalem. This is the Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I want to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Jesus looked ahead to the destruction of the city because the people of God are the invitation of God. And he knew what was going to happen because history showed that 40 years later, when the Roman soldiers would try to starve the Jewish community, there were fathers and husbands who would take the food from their wives and children. There were even accounts of cannibalism. It was horrific. Why would God do this? They refuse the invitation of God. Refuse to turn. And he's calling these women to weep, weep over their sins, weep over the sins of your, your fellow countrymen, your nation. There's a, a pastor, a young pastor down here, close to where I pastored before I came here. A few months ago on social media, he had this picture of his grandfather's celebrating his 90th birthday. And he shared that his grandfather had preached for 76 years. Think about that. He preached for 76 years. And he asked his, his grandfather, granddaddy, what's the difference between preaching now and preaching when you first started? And his grandfather said this, there's no brokenness over sin. There's no brokenness over sin. I just finished Book of Judges in my first Old Testament reading time. My first one, not the full. Boy, the heart of that book is very mindful of our nation today. The heart of, of the book of Judges, Judges 17, verse 6. <coughs> in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
in the message, the more modern translation, it's more blunt. People did whatever they felt like doing. People did whatever they felt like doing. It didn't bother them. We're confronted with our, our pride, the pride of our sins, the pride of our sins of our nation. I mean, folks, how atrocious it is we live in a nation with the murder of millions of babies in the womb. I mean, how atrocious, and what's even worse, our government taxpayer dollars pay for that. On top of that, we need to be weeping over the breakdown of the family in our country. I just read this past weekend, a, a private school in New York, they're going to stop using the, the terms mom and dad. No longer they're going to they're gonna use the terms mom and dad. Folks, this is a very, very hard truth, but it's the truth. But too many children for too long have missed out on the blessing of being raised by the biological father, biological mother, and committed marriage. And when you have that continue to start breaking down on a bigger scale, you continue to start seeing a country crumble. And we wonder how we got to this place where they redefine marriage. We wonder how we got to this place where they're starting to now have the states passing laws either for or against a boy signing, he feels like a girl needs to place a girl's school. And, and I get this, I, I get the anger. My, my flesh is only getting angry about it. But have we wept? Have we wept over the sins of our country, of our society, of our culture? William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, he sent some of his workers into a, a city to share the gospel and pass out tracks and lock my doors. And, Share Jesus. After two years, his workers sent a telegram in those days. That's how you, you communicate across the seas. And the telegram said, We've tried everything. We've knocked on doors. It's just no use. This doesn't work. And we would send a telegram from my back with two words Try tears. Try tears. And maybe you're not even try tears. When was the last time we just cried in anguish over our family and friends who were lost, who were headed to eternal hell? When was the last time we just mourned over our country and just the brokenness that we're just seeing our country and seeing these families just continue to disintegrate? When we encounter the suffering Christ, we're confronted with our cry. Our cry over our sins, the cry over our nation's sins. We're confronted with our call to carry across. We're confronted with our cry over our sins, our national sins, our personal sins. But third and finally, we are confronted with our comfort. We are confronted with our comfort. Now, I want to take you to the book of Isaiah. If you Bible, you want to flip over there to the book of Isaiah. I'm going to take you to Isaiah 53. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. You go past Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and you find the big book, the major prophet of Isaiah. Now Isaiah wrote his, his prophecy, his book, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. 700 years. That would have been like the year 1400 for us today. And Isaiah 53 is known as the chapter of the suffering servant. I want you to listen carefully to God's word. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version, the ESV here. Beginning in verse 3, Isaiah 53, now here. Here are Isaiah's words, 700 years before Jesus was born. This is what he says. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, we esteemed him not. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Verse 5. Listen carefully now. Here we go. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. If you have King James, he says, by his what? His stripes we are healed. New American Standard says, by his scourgings, we are healed. By his wounds, his stripes, his scourgings, we are healed. 
healed. He paid the price for our transgressions. The Apostle Peter, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote in 1 Peter 2, verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were When you look at the context of Isaiah's words and Peter's words, the healing is spiritual healing. I shouldn't switch it on our prayer. Mother, walk with me to Mark on Wednesday nights. It was a good time Wednesday night, wasn't it? Prayer words. And I share that our society is infatuated with physical healing. Man, you hear about somebody getting healed, man, they had a sickness, they finally got healed. But the greater healing, spiritual healing. I believe the greatest miracle of the spiritual healing. You say, preacher, how can you say that? What's so great about it? Well, here's what's amazing about it. Have you ever been wounded by rejection? Have you ever been wounded by loss? Have you ever been wounded by sin? Have you ever been betrayed? You see so much bitterness, unforgiveness? Find his wounds. John MacArthur shared three ways that were healed by Jesus' wounds in this passage. I'll share this with you very, very quickly from John MacArthur. First, he says that we're healed of the guilt of our sins through the cross. We're healed of our guilt, our sins through the cross. We're healed of the guilt of our sins through the cross. See, many of us, we know what we're guilty of. We know what we've done. And the devil likes to bring that guilt upon you and I over and over and over again. Yeah, I know what you did. Every people who know what you did. And yet Jesus, by his wounds, were healed of that guilt of our sins through the cross. Number two, we're also healed because Jesus can relate to our suffering. And Jesus can relate to our suffering. Jesus knows he's been there. You ever felt all alone like nobody else cares about you? Yeah, Jesus has been there. You ever felt betrayed and had your heart broken? Yeah, Jesus knows. You ever felt like you've just been devastated, like there's you're all by yourself, but everybody's against you? Yeah, Jesus has been there. He knows. He understands. He can relate to our suffering. But third, we're healed because Jesus makes us whole. He makes us whole. And that blind man, Martimaeus, was, was healed in his eyesight. But the greater healing was that spiritual healing. He was made whole. Every one of us is in need of healing. We all are in need of healing. Broken relationships, seasons of difficulty in our marriages, our children who go wayward and turn to the Lord, broken promises, broken dreams, the guilt of our past choices. Maybe some of us are still carrying heartbreak. Maybe some of us are still mourning the loss of someone taking us. Maybe we're, we're, we're hurt for having to deal with some sort of physical issue that's not going away. God, I pray that's still there. By his wounds, we are healed. What this looks like, what does this look like practically? I just saw the testimony of a man named Ellis Goldstein. And yes, you can imagine this man, Ellis Goldstein, a last name Goldstein, he grew up Jewish. And in college, some Christians witnessed to him and opened up God's word, and he got saved, he came to know Jesus, Yeshua, as his Lord and Savior. He got married to a Christian woman, Pauline. He had one child, a daughter named Heather. Heather came to trust Jesus at a young age. But at the age of 17, Heather was killed in a car accident. A one only child. And a few years later, his wife, Pauline, she was diagnosed with ALS with Gary's disease. And if you know how devastating that disease is, where your muscles just start shutting down, 
He watched his wife being unable to move and being unable to talk and unable to eat. And eventually she passed on. And Ellis shared his testimony. He said, you know, when my wife died, I said, God, you took my whole family from me. But then he said this. I saw God's grace and his mercy in a way I had not expected. He said, I saw my wife in this broken body to disintegrate. And I saw Jesus bring her home. He says, because that's what he did here. I know that. He brought her home to be with him. He said, I saw God's grace and his mercy in a way I had not expected. I didn't know what it would look like. And then I realized this is what it looks like. God showed his love that way. And then he closed. He said, when you come to believe in Jesus as Messiah, it means there is eternal life. And he had this big smile on his face. By his wounds, he had it doesn't mean that the pain goes away permanently. It doesn't mean that there aren't some bad days. It doesn't mean there aren't some days where it just gets hard and there's tears. But it does mean that by his wounds, by his stripes, by his scourgings, we are healed. When we encounter the suffering of Christ, we're confronted. Confronted with our call to carry our own cross. We're confronted by our own cries to cry over our sins, to cry over the sins of our nation. We're confronted with our comfort. By his wounds, we are healed. We're also confronted with God's word. Now, the very next verse in Isaiah 53, verse 6, says this Isaiah 53, verse 6, that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, he suffered to save us. He suffered to save us. As God's word says, all, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We're sinners. We're sinners. And the payment for our sin is death. It says that God laid the iniquity that should be laid on us. Eternal hell. But Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's why that name was laid on him. And you and I have a responsibility to respond. To acknowledge we're sinners. To believe in our hearts God raised Christ from the dead. To confess in our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord. And to allow him to be the Lord and Savior of our life. And maybe this day there is someone here, someone who's watching on our live stream this morning, this week. You know more speaking than you, hey. You need to come and trust Jesus, Lord and Savior. He's calling you just where you are, just to come and receive Christ as your Savior. Maybe still lots of us this day. Maybe we're, we're saved, but you know, let's be honest. Maybe we've just lost that wonder to get to salvation. And Jesus is just calling us to witness our Savior suffering for you, suffering for me. Maybe still others of us need to come and just repent of the sin in our life. Maybe we just need to come and just cry over our nation. Maybe we just need to come and acknowledge, you know, Lord, I just haven't taken my call very seriously. I've trusted you. I've, I've turned to you to be saved and keep myself out of hell. But Jesus, I'm not really following you. I'm not sacrificing for you. And maybe he's just come to you just to come and just offer yourself to him. Or maybe you to come and just say, Lord, you're awesome. I'm hurting. My heart's broken. I've got this physical ailment. By your stripes I'm healed. By your wounds I'm healed. By your scourges I'm healed. I want to have a word of prayer for us. We prepare our hearts to come as the Lord is calling us to respond to His word. If you bow your heads and close your eyes, we have this time of prayer. And as Holy Spirit calls you, you just come and respond to what God's calling. Lord God, we all are like sheep. We've gone astray. Every one of us has turned to his or own way. And you laid the iniquity of Jesus on us all. And some need to turn to you for 
salvation. Some need to re recommit to the call to give you us and take up our cross. Still others of us are calling us to cry, to repent over tears, over our sins, maybe the sins of our family, maybe the sins of our nation. Pray that we'll encounter the suffering Savior this morning, who will conform and transform us. Jesus' name.